Septuagesima Sunday, Sunday, as I said, is the, the first Sunday of a very short season of the church year called Septuagesima. This is sort of a buffer zone between the, the joyful seasons of Christmas and Epiphany and the, the severe penitential season of Lent. The church in her wisdom doesn't make us start fasting all of a sudden, especially after all the feasting and the celebrations that we've had lately in the last, since Christmas. And so she puts a sort of a shock absorber between Christmas and Lent. And this is really important because Lent is the most important time of the year for our souls. It's the time when our spiritual lives are the most active. And we make the most progress in our spiritual lives. Or maybe we repair the damage that has resulted because of our neglect since Lent of last year. And that the church knows that the better we prepare ourselves for this season, the better we will perform. And so right now she has us stretching our spiritual muscles like athletes getting ready to run a race as St. Paul says in the epistle, so that when Lent comes, we will be able to go flat out without hurting our souls. It's interesting that the feast of the conversion of St. Paul appears every year near Sessuagesima Sunday, or within a couple of weeks of it. This year, his, his conversion was this past Friday, just two days ago. Because this feast has a, a real correspondence to the seasons of Sassuagesima and Lent. The feast of the conversion of St. Paul has the longest mass of any feast day in the whole year, with the exception, of course, of feasts that have special ceremonies or ember days that have multiple epistles or things like that. But as far as regular feast days go, with the, the standard format of one epistle and one gospel and so on. This feast has the longest mass because the epistle is the reading from the Acts of the Apostles that tells the entire story of St. Paul's conversion. And St. Paul's conversion, despite all of its drama and wonder, bears a lot of resemblance to our own conversion from sin, which we hope that we will achieve in this season of Lent. So I thought I would talk today about the story of St. Paul's conversion and see how we can imitate that same process in our own souls this Lent. As you know, St. Paul was originally a Pharisee. His name was originally Saul. He probably heard our Lord speak many times with the other Pharisees. But like most of the other Pharisees, he did not believe in him. And for the same reason that, that they did. Because he was proud, he thought he had everything figured out. He had no need for our Lord's message of poverty, humility, and self-denial. The first time he appears in sacred scripture is at the martyrdom of St. Stephen when he held the cloaks of the, the Pharisees who were stoning him. But before St. Stephen was killed, he was put on trial by the Jews. And we read in the Acts of the Apostles that St. Stephen gave a very long and very beautiful speech, which we have recorded in sacred scripture, in which he warned them about rejecting our Lord. St. Paul was certainly present for the trial, and he heard St. Stephen's speech, but he did not take the warning. And then he, he saw St. Stephen get stoned to death, and he, he witnessed his heroic forgiveness of his killers. As St. Stephen was lying on the ground, having his bones crushed with, with the big stones, his last words, just like our, Lord, our Lord's last words, was were a prayer to God not to punish those who were killing him. And the fathers of the church teach that it was this prayer of St. Stephen 
that obtained for St. Paul the grace of conversion. But it was not immediately that his prayers were answered. Just as when we pray for someone's conversion, we don't usually get what we ask for right away either. It usually takes some time, sometimes a very long time. But of course, that does not mean that God is not hearing our prayers. God answers our prayers and will bring that person to conversion in his own good time. Anyway, God heard the prayer of St. Stephen and he decided he was going to convert St. Paul. But St. Paul was going to get worse before he got better. He became even worse after this this sin of murder, murdering someone for, for the, the name of Christ, which is the worst possible murder that could be committed. And he wanted to get permission to murder as many other Christians as he possibly could, in as many places as possible. And that permission was granted to him. He received orders from the Sanhedrin that he had the right to go to from one city to another and round up all of the Christians and put all of them to death. And so that's how it came to be that he was on horseback on his way to Damascus when God decided to step in. He was suddenly surrounded by a miraculous light and he fell off of his horse and he heard the voice of our Lord speaking to him. Our Lord said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And at that very instant, St. Paul was converted. He became a completely new man. But he was something else too. He was blind. The heavenly light had blinded him by the will of God in order to punish him and to humiliate him. And it says that he was trembling and afraid and he, he asked our Lord, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And our Lord said, go into the city and there it will be told to you what to do. Now the soldiers who were accompanying him came up and lifted him to his feet and they saw that he was blind and so they had to lead him by the hand into the city. You can imagine what a terrible humiliation this was for St. Paul. One minute ago he was a powerful man going to inflict his will on the citizens of Damascus, going to arrest all of the Christians. Now he can't even take one step without somebody helping him. That is always God's first step in bringing a soul to himself. He has to make the person humble. Pride is the cause of our sins. So if we are going to repent of our sins, we need to remove their cause. And we have to humiliate ourselves. So St. Paul went into the city and he, he stayed there for three days without eating or drinking anything. I'm sure that the way that made him feel will be very familiar to all of us in a couple of weeks. And so St. Paul stayed at the house of a, of a man named Judas, uh, most likely a Christian, not knowing what to do or, or where to go. All he heard was, was that God told him to go into the city and wait there. He didn't even know how long he was going to wait or what the, what was even going to happen next. So he had to just let go of the reins and let God, let God act and do what he wanted. And so after three days, God did act. He appeared to a disciple named Ananias, who was also a priest, who, who would subsequently be, uh, die as a martyr later on. But he told us Ananias, to go to a certain house in a certain street and he told him that there he would find Saul of Tarsus. And so he went and he found Saul and uh, his, he changed his name to Paul as God wanted. And he laid his hands on his head and he cured him of his blindness and he gave him food and he brought him into the Catholic Church. 
St. Paul immediately began preaching the gospel of our Lord in Damascus, in the very city where he wanted to eradicate our Lord's gospel. And then he went to other cities preaching and the rest, as we know, is history. St. Paul's conversion is probably the most dramatic story of anybody's conversion in the history of the church. Not only in the way that it was done, St. Paul being knocked off his horse and, and blinded and everything else, but also to whom it was done. He was the worst persecutor of the church, and he went from that to being the greatest apostle of, the, of, of all of them. After St. Peter, of course. But despite the unusual circumstances, the process by which God converted St. Paul is actually remarkably similar to the way he does the same in our souls, if we allow him, if we cooperate with grace like St. Paul did. First we see St. Paul, or Saul as he was called at the time, he was completely sure of himself, he was blinded with pride. He should have known the truth of our Lord. He knew all of the prophecies. He, he saw the miracles that our Lord worked. But he refused to accept it because of his pride. And so we also commit our sin out of our own pride. We know that our lives should not be what, what they should, our, our lives are not what they should be, but we, we close our eyes to it. We don't let ourselves think about it. And so God has to sometimes step in and humiliate us too. Sometimes God will send us chastisement, which humble us and, and make us see our need for God. He does that on an individual basis for, for souls that he sees needed. But God's church also, in her wisdom, sends everyone a sort of mild collective chastisement every year in the form of Lent. The church makes everybody a little bit uncomfortable for 40 days every year to make us turn to God too. And the church needs to make us uncomfortable to make us turn to God because we will not change anything as long as we are comfortable the way we are. As long as our daily habits stay the same, our spiritual habits are not going to change either. It's like somebody sitting in a huge, comfortable, lazy boy, easy chair, overstuffed chair, is a lot less motivated to move or to get up and go somewhere else than someone sitting on one of those folding metal chairs that we use here at the church. Those things will start to hurt your spinal cord if you lean back in them for too long. And eventually you'll want to stand up and walk around or, or go and sit on the nice soft view on, on the back wall of that the room back there. So we have to be made uncomfortable too. And we have to make some changes to our daily routine in, in Lent. We have to adjust what we eat, how much and when, what we eat. Most of us also change how much coffee we drink or how much beer. We change our entertainment in the evenings, what we listen to in the car on the way to work, and other things like that. And these changes that we make externally have an effect on our soul. They, they change our soul too. Our, our body and our soul are so closely connected that we can't change one without changing the other. When we sin with our bodies or our senses, our soul is stained with guilt. And in the same way, when we chastise our bodies, it is our soul that is healed if we do it with the right intention. And so God wants us to make changes to our spiritual lives this coming season. We are right now in the same disposition that St. Paul was before his conversion. We are Pharisees like him. We are just in our own estimation. We look down on everyone else like the, the Pharisee 
in the parable of the Pharisee and the publican, we refuse to see the error of our ways. But we need to recognize our guilt, and God in his mercy is helping us with that now, like he did with St. Paul. God will not knock us off of a horse like he did with St. Paul, but he does send us this time of penance every year when we are forced to look at our souls and look at our sins and make some changes. And like St. Paul, we have to say, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And then like him, we have to completely give up our own will, our own control over our lives, and we have to let God take control and be passive to his will. But in order to do that, we have to have a good lens. St. Paul could have resisted grace. He could have ignored the vision. He could have told himself that he was imagining things. Or he could not have obeyed what God commanded him to do. And in the same way, we we can go through Lent without making any real sacrifices, just barely keeping the fast laws easy as they are, or without doing any real penance. But what will happen to us if we do that? Well, what would have happened to St. Paul if he had ignored God? He would have lived and died a Pharisee, and he would have lost his soul. And if we don't, don't do any penance, we will live and die a Pharisee too. And we will probably lose our souls too. Because our Lord said that unless you do penance, you shall all likewise perish. But St. Paul did penance, and he was converted. And he became one of the pillars of the church, the greatest apostle of them all after St. Peter. That was all the work of God's grace. And God can transform our own souls this Lent, just like he transformed the soul of St. Paul. Of course, that's why he's sending us Lent in the first place, because that's what he wants to do with us. And he will transform us, too, into a Pharisee, from a Pharisee, into another St. Paul. But only if we say, like St. Paul did, with all sincerity and humility and obedience, from the bottom of our hearts, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.